guys, this is Lauren Hollis for NOI Education Services. And today we are kicking off just a little mini series about three episodes, basically talking about how to navigate ASQA's risk priorities for 2025. Now, obviously I was at Vogue probably a couple of weeks ago by the time that this drops. Um, and one of the focuses um, of a couple of the sessions was talking about the risk priorities for 2025. And I just wanted to go through each of those risk priority areas with you guys so that you could identify whether or not you're potentially sitting in one of those risk categories so that you can work out what your overall risk rating is. If, for example, you're going for an addition to scope, a cry cost uh, application, a uh, an RTO registration, a re-registration, um, you know, any of those sorts of activities, um, it's a good idea to always have an idea of what your kind of risk rating is. So the first risk rating that I wanted to talk about was um, non-genuine providers and bad faith operators. And I'm going to be honest, um, if you're watching this video, it's almost impossible that you're going to be in this category um, because these are genuinely the providers that are overtly going out of the way to do the wrong thing by the students and to um, not adhere to the RTO standards. Now, this is probably representative of maybe 1% of the providers in our industry. Um, however, it is often the 1% that tends to make um, headlines in the newspapers. It's the 1% that causes the regulator and the government to have to swing to a much more aggressive general stance. All right. So what do we mean by non-genuine operators? Sometimes people might think that non-genuine providers and bad faith operators is things like people who have, um, you know, people maybe who don't have all of their tasks in place um, or somebody who is looking at, um, you know, going on as a fit and proper person and maybe in the past has had an issue with um, one of their companies going into liquidation when they were younger and things like that. That's generally not what falls into this category. Um, unfortunately, there is a, a small section um, of some of the, you know, of, of organized crime um, things like that, whereby, you know, they're utilizing the education industry, they're utilizing the vet industry, they are utilizing the fact that there are people flying into the country um, to participate in serious organized crime. Now, unfortunately, in the past, and even still today, um, what that potentially leads to is, is it leads to the trafficking of um as slaves, um, it leads to it leads to human trafficking. It leads to um, serious abuse, uh, human rights abuse of students within particular organisations. Um, so, if you've never come across this in vet, I'm very very happy for you. It's definitely not the nicest side of vet. However, it is something that does happen. Um, and so, things like you know, massive funding fraud, fraudulent issuance of certificates where people are selling certificates and with no intention of providing any of the training. Um, a provider, providers that have consistently um, gone under and then utilize friends and family members or other people within their sphere to continue to reopen RTOs with that same sort of intent. Okay, as I said, infiltration of serious organized crimes um, bad faith operators coming into genuine RTOs by like purchasing and things like that um, in order to continue all of these bad things happening. So these are some of the activities. And this is the really the reason for why um, the new fit and proper person requirements came out earlier on this year was so that the regulator had more of an opportunity to be able to identify this. Now, something that I have noticed and I had a lot of discussions about recently was people really, if you are coming on board with an RTO in one of those higher managerial roles, um, it is actually really important that you do take the time to review the fit and proper person requirements for the organization. Now, this is if you have somebody coming into the organization. So let's say you're hiring a brand new RTO manager, you're bringing on board a new director, um, you're looking at selling a percentage of your shares to somebody, um, you actually really do need to have this discussion about who is a fit and proper person and particularly looking at where it states whether or not that, that fit and proper person has got family members who have run providers before. Um, it's incredibly important that you're very open and upfront with this process. So if you have had a family member who's run an RTO, 
where the RTO got cancelled, where it lost a funding contract for any reason. It's important that you actually document that accurately and that you then have a discussion. And I generally recommend to people that if you are submitting an FFP, sorry, an FPP, um, and there is an issue whereby you have to say, like, yes, I had a family member who had an RTO, who, who was with an RTO that lost a funding contract. So, you know, take the time to then write an addendum to that, add that in to the fit and proper person requirement, and then submit that through. Um, obviously, there are lots of people like myself in industry whereby, you know, we we are brought into RTOs who are in crisis, okay? I've been brought into RTOs in crisis in the last 12 months that have are on the risk of losing a funding contract, have been given an intent to cancel, um, you know, uh, have been deemed, you know, critically non-compliant. Um, so, you know, part of my my history and my, I mean, my fit and proper addendum is huge. Um, but, you know, that doesn't stop me from being a fit and proper person, but I have to be very, I'm very clear with the regulator that I have been brought into a wide variety of crisis situations to then help and fix RTOs. So it is it is a very, very strong recommendation. You have to be absolutely upfront and honest about it. If you're not upfront and honest about it um, and it's identified that that is the case, then, you know, you have absolutely no chance. I mean, that's, that's the best, absolutely the best way to be deemed a not fit and proper person is by not being clear and accurate and comprehensive with your FFP submission, with your FPP submission, okay? And if you're unsure, there are quite a few good um, RTO lawyers, okay, and RTO consultants that you can go and speak to about this matter and get advice from. So if you're unsure in any way, shape, or form whether or not you do present a risk as a fit and proper person, go and have a discussion, um, you know, with, you know, like a, you know, any of your AAT consultants are always really good. Judith Bowler would be somebody to speak to on that. Uh, there's a couple of really good um, lawyers out there like Peter Dukas. Um, you can speak to some of the really good consultants, you know, so you, like, you know, Matthew Dale, or, you know, the guys at Ordered Express, the guys at Vivacity, come and have a chat with us. Um, you know, ha Andrew Shea is a great person to reach. So reach out to some of the people who've been in our industry for a really long time who understand it. Um, and they can provide you with some advice as well, you know. Um, so it's really, really important to understand that that is the class of people that we're talking about when we're talking about non-genuine providers and bad faith operators. And it's very, very important that we're supportive of the regulator in that particular aspect of it because the things that happen within these spheres absolutely do have such a critical impact on the reputation of our industry they do happen in higher education as well, but they are far more often reported within the vet sector. And unfortunately, because we tend to have people who are coming from a much diverse, much more diverse um, array of backgrounds and educational experiences, there there can be a lot of rorting that does happen within that particular space. As I said, we're talking about like like one percent less than one percent of providers, but they are definitely the most riskiest, um, and there will continue to be a big focus on that. Um, specifically to the point that I believe that I think we've got 174 providers and 220 matters sitting with us for at the moment, and a small percentage of those do fall into that non-genuine providers and bad faith operators category. Now, international delivery is the second one um, that I will cover. It'll be the last one that I cover for this particular episode, and then we'll go into some of the other areas in our next one. But international delivery is going to continue to be one of those areas. And unfortunately, with the non-genuine providers and bad faith operators, a lot of that does happen internationally with people coming and going from offshore. Um, so international delivery is somewhat tied into that. Um, but what I will also say when it comes to international delivery is that we are dealing with um, we are dealing with an, an interesting an interesting subset of industry then because we do have, as many of you guys would have seen, so we've got this concept of the ghost colleges, which is basically where you've got marketing practices that are happening from particular agents um, where the agents are basically selling these courses on the basis of you don't have to come to class, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to do your assessments, you just have to pay your fees uh, and we will, you know, provide you. And sometimes this then leads into some of those like non-genuine bad 
bad faith providers where people are pushed into particular industries, uh, where they're put into employment contracts that are not legal. Um, again, we've got this, this issue of like people that are jumping into multiple areas, okay, and not disclosing those requirements, fraudulent issuance of qualifications, non-compliance with reporting obligations, which is why things like your prisons data is really, really important. Um, so that is, again, that's going to continue to be an area. If you are a crime plus provider, you need to understand that you are in the higher risk category if you're coming up for re-registration. Really do need to be taking extra time to make sure that you are having that all of your staff at all levels have a very, very strong understanding of the CRICOS requirements, okay? Particularly, I would be advising taking a look at 11.2, uh, taking a look at your prisons data and the obligations that you have around maintaining accurate prisons data and being very, very clear on your delivery and demonstrating how you are meeting your 20 hours of structured delivery, okay? That has been a very, very consistent theme, uh, how those 20 hours are managed, how attendance is being tracked, how course progression is being tracked, making sure that those things are being done in a very systematic way and that you are upskilling all levels of your staff to understand what those requirements are, that your PRISM system, your Asplanet, your TGA and your website and your student management system, that the data and information in those systems is all aligning. I would also be recommending to all RTOs that you are very, very cautious about the agents that you are choosing to work with. If your agent is requesting more than, than 40%, okay, as a fee for enrollment, walk away. There is absolutely no service that an agent offers that is worth 40% of the course. That is your profit, okay? Um, a, and, and the, the purpose of the agent is to facilitate the students making choices that are good for them, all right? So please make sure that you are actually speaking to your students that you are surveying them to see the quality of the information that they've provided and to, and to make sure that they, the information that they are provided with was accurate and that you're doing PD and due diligence with your agents, okay? This is a serious area that continues to hurt our industry is the poor practices of agents and the selling of courses to making students false promises that they're going to be able to come into the country and get PR and they're not going to have to do assessments and they're not going to have to do study. It's BS. It's it's absolute crap. Um, and so I really do need to be making sure that you've got strong processes in place for managing your agents and making sure that you are managing them in line with third-party requirements and in line with the Resource Act. All right, we do obviously have a lot more um, priorities to get through. So in our next couple of sessions, we're going to be talking obviously about academic cheating. That brings in all of the AI stuff. RPL continues to be an area of short course duration, student work placement, and online delivery. We're going to touch on those in the next two episodes. I hope that you guys have found this helpful. Obviously, if you have any questions, as per usual, you can pop them below. Feel free to disagree, but by all means, do so respectfully. Uh, my name is Lauren Hollows for NOI Education Services. I hope you guys found this helpful, and I hope you have an amazing day.